In this lesson, I am going to talk about the basis of a vector space. When is a set of vectors a basis for a vector space? It must satisfy these two conditions. First, S must span V. And second, S must be linearly independent. If a vector space has a basis consisting of a finite number of vectors, then we say that it is finite dimensional. Otherwise, it is called infinite dimensional. In this course, we will only be talking about finite dimensional vector spaces. Here is an example of a basis for R3. How do we check if it is really a basis? First, it has to be linearly independent. Let's call this V1, V2, and V3. Now take note that if you form the equation A1, V1, plus A2, V2, plus A3, V3 is equal to 0, then we would get A1, A2, A3 is equal to, what is the zero vector in R3? The zero vector is... The column matrix consisting of all zeros and therefore we get that a1 equals 0, a2 equals 0, and a3 is equal to 0. So indeed, it is really linearly independent. Next, let us check the second condition that it must span V. We have seen already in our previous lectures that this set really spans V. Or if you want, let us recall that if we get an arbitrary element in R3, an arbitrary element in R3, let's call that C1, C2, and C3, how do we write this as a linear combination of V1, V2, and V3? This is equal to C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus C3, so therefore, yes, it spans the entire vector space. Hence, this really forms a basis for R3 and we call this the standard basis for R3. We can generalize what we have seen for R3 for any vector space Rn. We've already seen this set here, our E1, E2 up to En. These vectors form a basis for Rn and this is called the standard basis for Rn. Let's look at an example of a non-standard basis for R2. We show that this set forms a basis for R2. First, let us check for linear independence. I will form A1, V1 plus A2, V2 is equal to the zero vector, which in this case is this one. So I will have A1 Simplifying this, we get Hence, we get this system of linear equations. I can just erase this. Hence, the corresponding augmented matrix would be Notice that the determinant of this matrix here is equal to negative 1 minus 1, which is negative 2. So therefore, it is not equal to 0. What does that tell us? It tells us that, let's call this A, it tells us that the homogeneous system of linear equations AX equals 0 would have the trivial solution only. And therefore, that means that A1 equals 0 and A2 equals 0. It is linearly independent. Of course, you could have stopped here and you can easily see that A1 and A2 are both equal to 0. However, I wanted to form this augmented matrix over here just to refresh your memory that whenever you want to set up this vector equation and you have column vectors over here, the resulting columns of your coefficient matrix will just be your column vectors. Next, let us check that it spans R2. Now recall that if it spans the entire R2, that means that if we take an arbitrary element in R2, let's call it C1, C2, 
then we can write it as a linear combination of these vectors over here. What will be the resulting augmented matrix? We would again have, just like what we had earlier, this would be the columns, 1, 1, 1, negative 1. It's just that in this case, we will now have C1 and C2. But then again, this coefficient matrix here has non-zero determinant. And if you have non-zero determinant, your A is invertible. This is your A. Your A is invertible. That means that if we form AX equals B, in this case, this, is, will, this will be our B, or any B over here, you would always have a solution, right? Because X is equal to A inverse B. Even if I don't solve for A1 and A2, I don't really need to solve for A1 and A2. I just want to show that I can always find constants A1 and A2 such that this vector equation would be satisfied. My point here is that there will always be a solution for this because the coefficient matrix is invertible. Now, what I want you to focus on is this. When we checked for both linear independence and spanning set, we just consider the resulting coefficient matrix, which is this one. And all we had to do was to check that its determinant is not equal to zero to show that this would form a basis. So it always works whenever you are checking whether a set forms a basis. Because in both cases, whenever you're checking for linear independence or for spanning set, spans the entire V, you are checking whether you have solutions to these vector equations. You will end up with the same coefficient matrix. It's just that you would have these two different things over here. All right, so therefore, what you need to do is you just have to form the coefficient matrix. And then check that the determinant of the coefficient matrix is not equal to zero to show that this forms a basis for your vector space. Let us show that this set forms a basis for P of T. Well, without any computations at all, it is easy to verify that this one here is linearly independent. Why? Because if I form a linear combination of these vectors and set it to the zero vector, the zero vector in P3 is the zero polynomial, then this would mean that, of course, all the constants are equal to zero because for polynomials you just have to equate the coefficients but since all the coefficients here are equal to zero then the constants ai's are all equal to zero it really spans p3 because if we get an arbitrary element of p3 how does it look like it is of this form a01 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3 x cubed. This is how an arbitrary element in P3 looks like. We can write it always as a linear combination of these four vectors. In general, we can do that for Pn. This will form a basis and we call it the standard basis for Pn. Another example of a basis, this elements over here, we've seen this already in our previous lectures, these vectors form a basis for M2. Again, you can check for linear independence and for spanning set. We have already shown in our previous slides that this really spans M22 because an arbitrary element in M22 can be written as a linear combination of these four matrices. We can generalize this for vector space M, MN. The Elements of the standard basis would be EIJ, where you have one on the ith row and on the jth column, but everywhere else it's going to be zero. Let me just write here the standard basis that we found for 
the three common vector spaces that we are using in this course. For Rn, for m, m by n, and for pn. So therefore, for Rn, we were able to find n basis elements for the set of matrices of size m by n. How many elements are in this set? We have m times n elements. And for pn, how many basis elements do we have over here? We have n plus 1. Now, why are we concerned with the cardinalities of the sets? The reason for that is given by this theorem. Suppose that we know that S is a basis for a vector space V, and this set has n elements. Then, every set containing more than n vectors is automatically linearly dependent. Remember that. Now take note that this is just saying that if you have, let's say, S has more than N elements, then it is linearly dependent. If the set has less than N elements, it doesn't mean that it is linearly independent. Remember that. You still have to check. What you just know is that if you exceeded already this number over here, it's going to be linearly dependent. So this is saying that if you have more than n vectors, your set is already big enough. And what will happen is that some of the vectors will already be a linear combination of the other elements. So for example, if V is R3, we already know that R3 has a standard basis and it has three elements. You have, we already know that we were able to find a basis for R3 and it has three basis elements. But this set over here has four elements. Let's call this S. It is greater than three, so therefore it is linearly dependent. So the previous theorem is really very powerful because we no longer have to check using the definition. Just by looking at the cardinality of S, and if it exceeds the number of known basis elements that we already know, then it will automatically be linearly dependent. However, be careful. For example, I have that my S is 1, 2, 3, and 2, 4, 6. Notice here that the cardinality of S is equal to 2 and that is less than 3. But this is not linearly independent, correct? This set over here is linearly dependent because 2, 4, 6 is a scalar multiple of... 1, 2, 3. Recall that if you have two vectors, it's very easy to check whether it is linearly dependent or not. If one of the vectors is a scalar multiple of the other, then it is linearly dependent. Another example. We have this set over here and our vector space is P2. And for P2, how many basis elements do we know of? We already know of the standard basis consisting of 1, x, and x squared. It has three elements, but this one has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. S is equal to 5, which is greater than 3 in this case, and therefore this is linearly dependent. Suppose we have our vector space V and we have a basis S consisting of n elements. Is it possible to have another basis, let's call it S prime, and let's say that the elements are W1 up to Wm. Is it possible that we can find another basis wherein the cardinality of that basis is different from the original basis that we know of? The answer there is no. It turns out that if we already know that a vector space has one basis with n vectors, then every basis for V will also have n vectors. Take note that the basis of a vector space is not unique. You can get different bases for a vector space. However, what we do know is that the number of elements in the basis will be unique. Whenever you have a theorem which counts something, it is very powerful. Never underestimate a theorem that counts something. 
So, for example, determine whether the following forms a basis for V. Just by looking at this, and our V is R3, and we know that for R3, if S is a basis, then the cardinality of S should be equal to 3 because we already know a standard basis for R3. So, the answer here is no. It is not a basis because it has only two elements. For the next one, again, this is also not a basis because it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 elements. And what should be the number of basis elements in P3? The number of basis elements in P3 is equal to 4 because the standard basis for P3 is 1x, x squared, and x cubed. So the answer here is no as well.